Would you open your copy of the Word of God, please, to the book of Psalms and find Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And we're going to look at this together today. I, I, I tell you what, I am ready for everybody to get well <laughs> and get back here. Amen. <laughs> I'm ready to be well. Are you ready to be well? I tell you what, just a few more shots of NyQuil and I, I may need to check into Betty Ford or something. <laughs> <laughs> this has been, I hadn't been sick so long for, you know, I mean, uh, it just seemed like, I don't remember when it was like, what it was like being well, but uh, we're going to keep confessing healing and we're going to walk in that and we're not going to let the devil get us down. Amen. We are going to get well. We are going to be all right and we're going to move on together. It was good to have somebody on the drums today, Mitchell. Good to have you back and looking forward to having our whole music uh, group back and, and congregation also. Uh, today I want you to look at this passage with me and we'll just uh, stand together now as we look at the first 11 verses. Psalm 37 and uh, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourselves in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He will do it. And he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret it only leads to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Well, Father, we, <clears throat> we thank you <clears throat> for the opportunity to be here even this day, this last day, this very significant last day. And uh, Lord, as we have already said, it's uh, a last of a lot of things. Father, I, uh, I just ask you that as we have opened your word together and we begin to look at its pages and the words thereon, that you will speak to us in a very powerful way through this passage of Scripture. Uh, Father, we need a touch from God. We long for a touch from God. And so we <clears throat> make it clear to you, Lord, that you are welcome in this place. We want you to reign and to rule in our midst. We want you to speak today. We want to draw near unto God today. And so, Father, we just make this plain. Then, Father, we thank you for the authority that we have in the name and in the blood of Jesus to stand and trample upon serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. And we speak out against every demonic force that would come against us as a church body, that would come against us as families, as individuals. And we say to you, in the name of Jesus, not in our name, but in his name, we say to you, depart from us. Depart. You are released from your assignment. You are released in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you have said what we loose on earth is loose in heaven. And we loose these spirits that come against us. Spirits of sickness and infirmity and all kinds of other things that, that are attacking us and our families now. Thank you, dear God, for the power there is to wage warfare in the spirit realm. Now, Lord, we ask you to speak and make it plain to us. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen. Would you be seated, please? <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, conversation going on now. Maybe you've uh, 
maybe you've seen it on television, and, and what they're doing is, uh, what I'm referring to, I should say, is uh, they're trying to get a list up of the most significant people, uh, the most significant people who have lived in, in the last millennium, and then also the, the most significant people that have lived in this century. And maybe you've seen these uh, things on television where they're, they're putting forward uh, names of people that, that might be considered significant people of, of our time. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, a name I have not heard in connection with all of that is a name that, that uh, you don't hear very much anymore. It's the name of Helen Keller. And to me, Helen Keller is, has got to be somewhere on that list. I mean, here, here's a, a, a person that she was born a normal birth, she was a, a normal baby, and, that, and yet she <clears throat> contracted a fever, and from the fever and so forth that she went through and, and uh, somewhat some bungling on the part of the doctor that attended her, Helen Keller ended up both blind and deaf. I mean, that's just about as cut off from the outside world as you can get, both blind and deaf. And yet, this woman grew to have a life uh, where she was able to communicate, to be communicated with, and she became a writer and a powerful, powerful witness to the love and grace of Almighty God. Now, somehow, somebody like that, to me, deserves to be on that list. Now, here's somebody that was, that was blind and deaf to the world around her. But you know what? There are a lot of people that we know that are also blind and deaf to the world around them because they are blind and they are deaf to the spirit realm. They are blind and they are deaf to those things that are true and everlasting. You know, the thing about what you and I can see and feel and touch and taste and so forth, it's temporary. It's temporary. Amen? Amen? You, this body that you're in this morning, it's temporary. It's te if you don't believe it, go back like I did this last week and look at some old home movies <laughs> and see the difference between like 1995 when I bought that camcorder and, and today. And I tell you what, there's a difference in this old body, I tell you that. There's a difference in yours too. This is temporary. It's only going to last a little while. Now, we're going to have a glorified body one day. We know that. God's going to redeem us, not just in the spirit, but also in the physical. We're going to be redeemed totally. He does a total work. And that's going to all happen. But I tell you what, the things that you and I see are very, very temporary. And, and, and sometimes we, we, as we look into the spirit realm, we realize that the things of the spirit are the things that are truly permanent. The things seen are temporary. The things unseen are permanent. And so many people that you and I know that we rub shoulders with day after day, they just don't know that. They don't seem to understand that. They're living for the moment. They're living for the day. They're living for just what can be had in this life. And to be very frank and honest about it, sometimes we get caught up in all that too. Isn't that so? We get caught up in the temporal. We get caught up in, in what's here and now and, and what we want to have and what we want to enjoy. And, 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 and we let ourselves put blinders on. We're not blind and we're not deaf to the things of the Spirit. But we let ourselves be blinded. We let ourselves lose track of what's really and truly going on. Now as we look at this psalm this morning, we find that that the psalmist, writing as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance, he warns us about being fretful. About being fretful. Now I wonder, how many, t how many times this last week did you use the word fret or fretful? Very few of us use that, that kind of verbiage, that kind of word, fretful. You do, you, I, I haven't had anybody come to me uh, this week and say, Pastor, I've just been so fretful this week. <laughs> <laughs> Would you pray for me because I've been fretting <laughs> this week? <laughs> well, what does it mean? What does it mean to be fretful? What does it mean to, to fret? I mean, the Bible says here, don't do it, so we need to know what we're not supposed to do, amen? Don't fret. 
Well, when we begin, begin to look at this word, and we go back to the original language, and, and we try to get some understanding from that, we, we, we find out that it has primarily to do, as a matter of fact, the, the word that, that's used here, the translate here to fret, it really means uh, to, to, to get warm, to get hot, to glow. talking a little bit here about being angry people. He's talking here about what we might say today about being uptight. Now, has anybody this week said, I'm uptight? <laughs> you heard anybody say this week, I'm, I'm so uptight? Folk, listen, uptightness, fretfulness, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that plagues us all. We may not call it by the, the same term, but, but we have problems with this matter of being uptight, don't we? Can you say Amen. Is anybody following me on? We have problems with this thing of getting uptight, don't we? And uh, I, want to, I want us to look at this today and think about when the uptight or the upright get uptight. When you and I get uptight about things. And, and, and we get uptight about a lot of things. First thing I want us to think about is the source of getting uptight or fretting or letting our anger get away from us. Letting ourselves begin to, to grow in heat. To let ourselves grow in, in that, that glow, not, not of glow of, of love, but that glow of anger and wrath and, and uh, the fretfulness that comes, the uptightness that comes upon us. One of the things that causes us to get uptight is what we see as the inequities of life. And we, we uh, observe things, it's like the, the psalmist here, he's troubled by the same things that you and I are troubled by from time to time. He, he said, I, I just don't get it. I, I, you know, uh, uh, here, here are these people over here, they're not even trying to live for God. And they seem to be doing well. How many of you ever thought that? Come on now, be honest with me. And you, he's saying, I, I just don't understand because I know this person's not living for God. They don't profess God. They're not trying to live by God's rules at all. Oh, they may have their name on a church roll somewhere, but they, they're so far from God, and yet they seem to be just raking it in, and everything good is happening to them. And he says, you know what? That kind of thing makes me uptight. Can you identify with that? Be honest now. We get uptight about that kind of thing. I mean, we're just human. You know, we, 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 we reason things out without... Without removing those blinders, we, we're blinded, we're, we're deaf in ourselves, and we begin to look at things in human terms, and we think, I just don't get it. Look, here, I'm trying to live for God. I, I've given my heart to Jesus. I'm trying to live for God. I, I'm trying to, to work for God. I'm trying to, to tithe and, and do all these things for God, and, and it just seems like one thing after another goes south on me. Have I been reading somebody's mail here this morning? <laughs> Amen? And, and, and we think, my goodness, what, what in the world is going on here? Well, you know, we know for, for sure when we take a stand for God, guess what? We have an enemy. And that enemy, what's he going to do? He's going to attack you when you stand up for God. Is that right? He's going to start tapping on you exactly at the point of which you have made some kind of a commitment. You make a commitment about uh, anything. Giving. Reading your Bible. Witnessing. And guess what? Guess where the enemy is going to hit you broadside? In that area. We, we pray for the sick. We pray for healing. And what do we do? We get sick. It's like he's just saying, nah, 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 you can't make it stick. Yes, we can make it stick. But it seems like the inequities of life, it just seems like sometimes that the scales is, is not the, balanced the way it should be. We raise our children up to, to seek to, be, uh, to fair, be fair-minded and expect fair play, but in life, how often do you really find it like that? And the inequities of life bring us to a point of being uptight. But not just the inequities of life. There's, there is a, an increase in evil in our day that gets us uptight. 
I, I know that you're connected with our, our uh, society just like I am. You see what's going on. And, and sometimes it's, it, it's been so subtle that we haven't really realized it, but, but we're living in a day that there's a terrible, terrible increase in evil in our culture. And that's cause for us to get concerned and to get uptight about it. I, I don't know if you go to movies or not. We, we, I was raised on movies, and I, I love movies, but I tell you what, it's hard to go to a movie anymore. We went, uh, we went this week, and we, we went to see a, a movie that, uh, I mean, this was a family movie. This was a movie about a uh, goofy premise. Maybe you, you've seen the commercials on it. Stuart Little, have you all seen that? Where this family adopts a mouse as their son. Anyway, it's, you know, it's, it's a kid's movie. And I, I sit there, and I'm watching that movie, and I swear about three or four times there were four-letter words used in that movie. I'm sitting there thinking, this is a kid's show. What are they doing? And and, and I'll use this. This is a very mild, you know this is a mild example of what I'm talking about. And we can get really uptight. We can get really fretful about the increase in evil in our day. The inequities of life, the increase in evil, the inconsistency of of others. Uh, I mean... It's, it's like nowadays, you, you don't expect our leaders to do what they say they're going to do. It's almost like whatever they promise during the campaign, you can count on it, and they're not going to do that. And, and, and we sit, here, sit back and we, we try to get involved in the political process, and I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. We, we ought to do that. And we get involved and we try to make a difference. We try to elect the right people. And it just seems like no matter what, there's still this matter where, where, where there's inconsistency. And we elect somebody, we think, this is a guy that believes just the way we do. He says it just like we say it. But he just doesn't do it the way we thought it should have been done. And we get so upset about that. About the inconsistency of others, our leaders and so forth. And there's one other thing too. Before we leave this matter of the source of our fretfulness. And that is we get uptight you ready to be honest about it? We get uptight about the inactivity of God. We get uptight because we think God ought to do something. And He ought to do something quick. Amen? And, and, and we, I mean, I'm just trying to be honest this morning. And we really sometimes get uptight because we can't really see the hand of God moving. You know what? That doesn't make us unusual. That doesn't make us different. That just makes us like everybody else. Down through, You can read about that in the Bible. You can read about people just like that in the Bible. That, that Read Habakkuk. And Habakkuk just keeps crying out to God. He says, look at what's going on. Look at what's happening. Can't you? You can see what's going on. You can see it all. Why, why don't you do something? And then God says to Habakkuk, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. And then, and then Habakkuk says, why are you going to do that? <laughs> you know, he wants God to do something, but then when God starts to act, he said, I don't want you doing it that way. Does anybody identify with Habakkuk just a little bit? I'll tell you what God did do with Judah when he let the Chaldeans come in and take them captive for those years. He cured them permanently of idolatry. That would have been their besetting sin all down through when they first be, uh, occupied the, the, the promised land was they would involve themselves in idolatry. And God cured that. But there was Habakkuk. He was complaining to God because God wouldn't do anything. And then he complained about what God was going to do. Then finally he just caved in and said, Lord, you just do what you, what you see is right. That's where we need to get. How about Mary and Martha? How about them? When their brother died, and Jesus took his sweet time getting there. What did they say to Jesus when he came? They said, Lord, if you had just been here, our brother would be alive. If you'd just been here. Now don't tell me they were not uptight. Was that Jesus? 
you mighty right they were. If you'd just been here, you took your sweet time getting here, now our brother's dead. If you'd come on, I mean, you're supposed to have really loved our brother. And, and now look, he's, he's wrapped up in days in the tomb. Where were you when we wanted you? Well, folks, we're kind of like that too. And we don't see God moving according to our schedule. We are prone to get uptight with God, to get fretful with Him. You know what? Not only do we need to think about the sources of fretfulness, we need to understand fretfulness is a sin. It's a sin to fret. How do you know that? He says, don't do it. He said, don't fret. Don't get uptight. <laughs> and this is something we can't do without the grace of God being active in our lives. Amen? But he says it's a sin to fret. And you know what really it gets down to the bottom line when we're fretful over things in this life? You know what the bottom line is? When, we're, when we are fretful, what we're saying is, what fretfulness is, it's the opposite of having faith. And so when, when, when these things begin to disturb us, the inequities of life, it doesn't seem like this thing is balancing out the way it really ought to. When it seems like the inequities are, are just not going our way, when we seem like the, the, uh, the increase of evil, Lord, this thing just doesn't seem to want to stop. It's just trying to devour our whole culture. When, when our, our leaders are inconsistent, we say, God, how do we end up with a, a person in office like this? And when... God's inactive, we get so uptight. What we're really expressing is we're expressing, the, we're, exp we're just like the man on the street. We, we ought to know better. We ought to know better. We ought to know God is in charge. God is on his throne today, dear people. <laughs> and as we come to the end uh, of all these things we talked about a moment ago, the, the year, the century, the millennium, and all that, and we're looking forward to all brand new stuff, we need to realize this. God is on His throne. He's on His throne. Why, Y2K doesn't scare God? These terrorists that were worried about spoiling our, our New Year's celebration, God's not worried about those terrorists. God's on His throne. And he's not on his, on his throne in a worldwide sense. Friend, listen, he's on his throne when it comes to specifically in your life. He's on his throne. Now, we've talked a little bit about the source of fretfulness. We talked about the sin of it, but I want you to see the solution to it, and that's what we're tapping on right now. Look at these verses with me. You know what? <clears throat> you, can, you can make you a list, or you can just... You can just number these as we go. I mean, it's right here. Get you one of these books. It's right here in this thing. Look, it says, what are you supposed to do then? Verse 3. What's it say? What? Trust in the Lord. That's the first thing that we're to do. When we begin to sense ourselves getting uptight, first thing we need to do is we need to back off. And we need to start trusting in the Lord. You know, we tend to do the same thing the same way every time, don't we? Have you ever noticed that about yourself? Have you ever noticed that, that you have patterns of behavior? Have you ever noticed that? Those patterns, my friend, I know about me, and I know a little bit about you too. Those patterns need to be broken, and we need to replace those patterns with new patterns. Instead of falling into fretfulness and the gloom of doom or in intense anger and getting ourselves into deeper and deeper trouble, what we need to do first of all is we need to do what it says here. Trust in the Lord. To trust in Him. <coughs> to put our, our total faith, our confidence in the Lord. Trust in Him. And what else? Trust in Him and do good. Trust in Him and do good. Our natural way is to pay back. Our natural way is to give back what we got with a little extra. Amen? But the Lord says, trust me. You just trust me now. Trust me and you do good. 
Trust me and you do good. Look at the second thing that we're told to do. <coughs> it says dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Dwell in the land. Now of course this had to do with Israel, had to do with their position in the land of Canaan. Dwell in the land. What does that mean to you and me? It means stay put. It means you, take, you dig in and you stay where you are. Don't run. I'll tell you what, if the enemy can ever make you run, he'll keep you running forever. I'm going to have to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. If the, it can make you run, he'll keep you on the run the rest of your life. And what the Lord says to do, he says, you, you just hang tough. Trust in me. Do good. Hang tough. And what happens when we do that stuff? Here's what happens. Then we'll begin to cultivate faithfulness. Is this making any sense? Cultivate faithfulness. There's something that without it you cannot please God. What is it? Faith. Where is the enemy going to attack you most heavily and most, most severely? In the area of your faith. But he says that we're to hang tough and to cultivate faithfulness. It is appointed that a steward must be found faithful. In the book of James it says, Count it all joy, brethren, when you enter into various temptations, for you know that that trial is going to bring you into a deeper place of, we might say this morning, cultivated faith. Do you need to hear this this morning? Anybody here there to hear it? I need to hear this this morning. Amen. I mean, you know what like we said the other day, it seemed like just about the time you think you're getting in the shallow water, you step in another hole. You, know? and, and you step in that hole and you're back up to here and you're saying, don't make a wave. And here comes the devil in his speedboat, you know, just plowing it all up. Folks, listen, we need to do what the Bible says. We need to trust in the Lord. We need to do good. We need to, to make sure that, that we're hanging tough. And that we're cultivating this matter of faithfulness. And here's a beautiful word here. Look at the next verse. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Let's go and read the rest of that. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. I tell you, when you, when you go back and you look at this, this in the original language and you begin to see the the meanings that, that are attached to this. Delight yourself in the Lord. It, it's, it's a picture here of, of uh, <clears throat> like a couple of sweethearts. It's a picture of, of uh, those that are just so fondly in love with each other. That's what God wants. <laughs> he, wants to do, he wants to be our sweetheart. He wants to be our... He wants us to, to delight ourselves in Him. We delight ourselves in every other thing under the sun. But He says, delight yourself in me. You see, when, when, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, when we let ourselves just uh, fall into a, a love situation with Almighty God, when we let Him be our sweetheart, You know what? You know what? You know what? When you're when you're really in love with somebody, circumstances don't really make all that much difference. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, baby, I was thinking about some of the dumps we lived in. <laughs> but uh, we made it all right, didn't we? I mean, we we actually lived. In trailer, we live twice in, in mobile homes that uh, are smaller than what most people go on vacation in. And we did it with kids. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> but you know what? Circumstances don't really matter when you got something going for you. Amen. And and I I just can't help but think that what, that that's the way God wants us to be with Him. That He wants us to be so delighted in Him that the circumstances don't really make all that much difference. Does that make sense? But you know that verse goes on and says, if we'll do that, then He'll give us the desires of our hearts. 
And you know what that means. It means that God is going to, he's going to, as we get deeper and deeper in love with him, then he is going to make our desires, desires his desires. And he'll give us our desires and he'll grant us our, our desires. Let me go ahead here quickly. Verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He will do it. Commit your way to the Lord. <laughs> that word for commit there, it, it, it literally means to roll. It's used throughout the Old Testament. I looked at a number of places in the Old Testament, and, and it has to do, uh, very often a physical sense, it had to do with like rolling a stone. Rolling something. He's saying, roll your cares over on God. And, and the image here is, is, is that crushing burden that you may feel like you're under this morning. And I don't know what it may be. I don't know what kind of burden you may sense yourself being under this morning. But, but here's what God says for you to do with that. He says, just, just roll that on over. Just roll that on over on me. In the book of 1 Peter, he says, cast your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. What is it that's really, really ripping you up this morning? My dear friend, God says, just roll that over on me. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He will do it. Look in verse uh, 7. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Rest in the Lord. And, and this has to do with just being silent. Just, just not silent in the sense that we're not crying out to God, but silent in the sense that we're resting and trusting in him. Resting in the Lord and waiting patiently for him. This is where the rubber meets the road, is waiting patiently for the Lord. Do you have a problem with patience? Amen. Amen. I mean, we, we want to see it right now, don't we? We want, we want as I've said, you know, we want, to, we want God to work faster than Barry Aspirin, amen? We want him to get going. And yet he's trying to build something in us. You know what? It's so true. God is not concerned with our comfort. He's concerned with our character. And his number one agenda is to build our character into the character of Christ. And we keep wanting God to get moving here, but we're to wait patiently for him. Wait patiently on the Lord. I think I told you about the fellow that uh, he was uh, trying to get to the, catch the train at 6.30 and he was running down the road and he, he cut across a pasture at this certain farm and as he cut across the pasture, he saw the farmer and he said, I hope you don't mind, I'm cutting across your pasture. I'm trying to make the 6.30 train. And the farmer called back and said, if my bull sees you, you may make the 6.15. <laughs> Sometimes... You know, we just don't want to wait. But he says to wait patiently for him. And look at this last thing. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. Listen, folks. When we begin to fret, when we begin to grow angry, when we begin to get hot, when we get uptight, you know whose field we're playing on? We're playing on the enemy's field. Remember I said something a while ago about patterns of behavior? The devil knows your patterns. He knows what your patterns of behavior are. And he knows just how to get you and just how to get me onto his playing field. And so what we need to do is we need to break these patterns of behavior and start doing things God's way. Can you say amen? I don't know what your circumstance may be this morning. You may be looking at some real hard things. There may be some difficult things going on in your life right now. But look at what it says in verse 11. The humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. We live by promises, not by explanations. We need to stand on the promises of Almighty God. Trust in Him. Commit our way to Him. Delight ourselves in Him. Wait patiently for the Lord. 
and he'll bring it to pass. Father, we thank you so much for the truth of what we've looked at today. <clears throat> Father, we just uh, we want to wrap up all of our cares, all of our fretfulness, all of the things that are troubling us, our uptightness. And Lord, we just want to roll that over on you this morning. Or we, we don't have strong enough shoulders to carry the burdens that we're carrying. And we just want to roll them, roll them on over on you today, Lord, like you've told us to do. Father, we want to break these patterns of behavior that just seem like they get us into deeper trouble all the time. And we want to do things your way. And so, Father, we just come to you and we ask for you by your grace to continue the good work that you've begun in us. Lord, I pray that you would. Uh, even though we want comfort, we know you want character. And so, Lord, you do the work you need to do in us, and we'll be careful to give you the praise for it. Father, we pray for anyone in this room right now that's got a broken heart. We know that you can fix a broken heart. You can mend it if we'll just give you all the pieces. And so, Lord, we come to bring these to you now. In Jesus' name.